Futurama is known for a lot of things. A wide cast of hilarious, unique characters, incredibly fun, impressive sci-fi premises, an impeccable attention to detail, and intelligent humor that can actually teach you while you're laughing. But the thing people seem to talk about the most are its effective, unexpected emotional gut punches. And y'all know <laughs> there are some doozies, and some of the most effective were the ones that focused on the people Fry left behind. For me personally, the real core of Futurama's emotionality is Fry and Leela. In fact, I would say that this is the most important through line in the series, and there's a reason that in the four different potential series finales Futurama aired, there was a major focus on Fry and Leela's relationship in each one of them. Many of the series' major emotional moments involved their will-they-won't-they they dynamic. It sort of laid out this idea that Fry's real life was always meant to be in the 3000s, and always played up the fact that Fry was better off in the future. They often even alluded to the idea that nobody in the year 2000 even missed him all that much. In fact, I think this was what Fry expected to be true. He said as much in the pilot. I'm sure this must be very upsetting for you. You know, I guess it should be, but actually I'm glad. I had nothing to live for in my old life. And episodes like The Cryonic Woman further showcased why Fry may have felt this way. The police were going to conduct a search, but your parents felt it was a waste of taxpayer money. That's the same reason they kept me out of school. But then came the look of the Fryrish, which for my money is the best episode the series has to offer. This story dropped in the middle of Futurama's third broadcast season, and it was the first to truly and thoroughly explore the questions, how did the Fry family react to Phil going missing? Did they care? Did Fry's absence have any real effect on the people he left behind? It's the kind of question the show didn't really want to deal with early on in its run, and understandably so. Futurama is a comedy, and it's hard to establish your funny show while openly dealing with the idea that your entire premise has left heartbreak in its wake. But now a healthy couple of seasons into the series, the writing staff felt it was finally time, and this was an idea they would explore three additional times after The Luck of the Fryrish in Jurassic Bark, Cold Warriors, and Game of Tones. Honestly, each of these four episodes could have their own thorough individual breakdown. In fact, I highly recommend you go check out Shady Durag's video about Luck of the Fryrish. It's well worth your time, I really, really enjoyed the video. But for this this video, I wanted to step back a little further and look at the hole that Fry's absence left in his family entirely. So these episode rundowns will kind of be brief before we examine the larger picture. The Luck of the Fryrush focuses on Fry's relationship with his older brother Yancey and their teenage rivalry over Fry's lucky seven-leaf clover. Throughout the flashback sequences, we see how Yancey's jealousy over Phil manifested all the way back when he was born. Look, Yancey, it's your baby brother, Philip. It also showed that throughout their childhood, Yancey would continually copy the ideas that Fry came up with, whether that was basketball shots or breakdance moves. The robot! The robot! That's similar to mine! When Fry discovers a statue of Yancey sporting Fry's lucky seven-leaf clover, but with a plaque reading Philip J. Fry, he assumes his brother stole his entire identity alongside his clover. But when Fry goes to recover his lucky clover from Yancey's grave, he discovers the heartbreaking truth. Son, I'm naming you Philip J. Fry in honor of my little brother who I miss every day. Yancey actually named his son after Phil, breaking a long-standing family tradition to honor his lost brother. Here lies Philip J. Fry, named for his uncle, to carry on his spirit. Jurassic Bark is possibly the most emotionally manipulative and infamous Futurama episode, and it showcases Fry's relationship with his dog, Seymour. When Fry discovers the unmistakable fossil of his dog in a museum exhibit, he campaigns to get his dog back and potentially clone him to bring him to the year 3004. Interestingly, the original pitch for this episode was that Fry found the fossilized corpse of his mother, but I think they were right to change it up for this one. Throughout the flashbacks, we see Fry's loving relationship with Seymour, and it's genuinely heartwarming. We even see the hours leading up to and following Fry being frozen. I won't be gone long, Seymour. Just wait here till I come back. When Fry doesn't return, Seymour desperately searches for Fry and he actually finds him. He does his best to tip off Fry's family, but to no avail, even with Fry's parents literally standing in front of their son's frozen body. In the year 3004, when Fry learns that Seymour lived to the ripe old age of 15, he decides not to clone him. I'll never forget him, but he forgot me a long, long time ago. And then comes the major emotional manipulation. And dear Lord, this one still hurts. I watched it the other day and I could not stop myself from crying. When Fry told Seymour to wait for him, he listened. He waited for 12 more years in front of Panucci's Pizza until he rested his head down for the last time. That's, God, Seymour is just such a good boy. The accompanying song really helps this moment punch you right in the heart. Oh man, 
All right, quick, let's move on before I start crying again. In Cold Warriors, our flashback sequences feature Fry's relationship with his father, Yancey, and starts out with the father-son fishing trip when Fry was 14 years old. We see Fry fall through the ice before the rest of the episode showcases Fry's entry in a science fair. Throughout the episode, Fry's father is really hard on him, offering him no praise, and even instead praising his science fair rival, Josh Gedge. That's some dry, emotionless science. Nice job, son. We get the sense that this was how his father treated Fry for the entirety of their relationship. He's a stone-faced, hardened man who didn't show Fry much love. You home from school, you traitor. I fell through the ice. Cut me some slack. The end of the episode actually jumps back to right after Fry fell through the ice on the fishing trip, and we get this really lovely moment between the two of them. I know I give you the business sometimes, but if I'm hard on you, it's only because I want you to grow up strong and resilient. This, of course, recontextualizes everything we saw in the episode. We were given the impression that Fry didn't really think his father cared much about him, but we now know that the entire time, this was his way of showing Fry love and helping to prepare him for the future. Literally. Someday, you may face adversity so preposterous, I can't even conceive of them. But I know you'll pull through and make me proud. Game of Tones handles its flashbacks a little differently, this time using the Inception method to walk through Fry's dreams and memories. While attempting to solve a mystery involving a deafening tone that is slowly destroying the Earth, the professor discovers that the answer may lie in Fry's memory of the very day he was frozen in 1999. We see the events leading up to the moment Fry was frozen, but when Fry realizes this was the last time he would ever see his family, he pauses and instead decides to cherish this last evening with them, particularly with his mother. This, of course, puts the actual Earth in danger, and Fry must pull himself away from his own closure for the good of the planet. After they solve the mystery, we get another heart-wrenching scene. Fry dreams once more about his mother, but Nibbler appears to reveal that this is in fact his mother's dream, not his own. He has one last chance to spend time with his mother, and she would actually experience it. I've dreamed about you a lot since you disappeared. What did you want to tell me? A really Really beautiful twist and a lovely final scene. These four episodes really do operate well as a set. In fact, they all have really great nods and references to one another. In Luck of the Fryrish, we see Fry's dad reading a magazine called Cold Warrior right after Fry was born, and Cold Warriors would be the episode title that focuses on their relationship. In Cold Warriors, we see one of Yancey's attempts to steal Fry's Seven Leaf Clover, as featured in Luck of the Fryrish. In Game of Tones, Fry re-experiences his final interaction with Seymour from Jurassic Bark, but knowing it's actually a dream, he uses dream logic to bring Seymour with him. Maybe my favorite connection. In Luck of the Friarish, Mrs. Fry gives this offhanded remark. I just wish your brother were still around to see this. I'll never forget the day Philip disappeared. Wisconsin won the Rose Bowl 17-9. Then in Jurassic Bark, we see her watching that very football game on New Year's Day, and in her dream at the end of Game of Tones, you hear them announce the final score of the Rose Bowl on the TV. Well, that's it. Wisconsin has defeated Stanford 17-9 in the 2000 Rose Bowl. It sort of recontextualizes that initial joke, now that we know this important dream featured both the score of that game and the last time she ever spoke to Phil. I think the best way to truly contextualize the profound impacts that Fry's absence had on his family is to look at all of these events chronologically. In 1988, Fry goes on a fishing trip with his father. He falls in the ice, and his dad reveals the truth of why he's so hard on him. He wants to help prepare Phil for the incomprehensible hardships that the future might hold for him. Throughout 1988, Phil has a tough year. He's trying hard but failing to win the science fair, all while persistently fighting with his older brother over his seven-leaf clover. He eventually hides the one thing that brings him good fortune, because he doesn't trust his own brother's jealousy. He goes on to lose the science fair and embarrass himself in front of his father. In 1997, Fry meets Seymour, and the two become inseparable. They spend a year and a half as best friends. On December 31st, 1999, Fry has his final dinner with his family before going to work that night. Seymour goes with him as usual. When Fry leaves for his final delivery, Seymour tries to stop him, but Fry tells him to just wait there for him. Fry arrives at Applied Cryogenics, realizes it was a crank call and falls backward into a cryogenic freezer tube as the new year is rung in. The next day, Seymour desperately searches for Fry, eventually tracking his frozen body down at the cryogenics lab. A few days later, Fry's parents arrive to retrieve Seymour, not seeing their son in the freezer tube in front of them. Seymour goes back to Panucci's Pizza and waits. Around this time, Mrs. Fry dreams of Philip, who embraces her and assures her he's okay. A few years later, Yancey is at home trying on his father's tuxedo for his wedding. He goes downstairs to look through Phil's record collection for the reception and discovers Fry's seven-leaf clover. In 2007, Yancey's son is born. 
He gives him the seven-leaf clover and names him Philip J. Fry, after his brother. This breaks the long-standing Fry family tradition of naming their firstborn sons Yancey. In 2012, after waiting for Fry for 12 long years in front of Panucci's Pizza, Seymour rests his head for the final time. Laying out Fry's entire relationship with those he left behind like this, I think, truly contextualizes the impact he had on them, even long after he was gone. And while the family was in ways very hurt by his loss, they all had their own form of closure with Phil. Yancey Sr. believed that the way he treated and raised Phil would prepare him for even the most difficult adversity he could possibly face, and believed that no matter where Fry was, he would be okay. Mrs. Fry was fortunate enough to dream of Phil, and even got a genuine final moment with him in her dreams, even if she didn't realize it was genuine. Yancey Jr. spent his entire life copying Fry, and in the end, the old adage is true. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Yancey envied Phil because he admired him. To carry on his spirit, he would name his son Philip J. Fry. And Fry left more than just closure behind for the nephew he would never meet. Over the course of Philip J. Fry II's life, he would become one of the world's most successful men. If the logic of the show is to be believed, this is a direct result of Phil's clover. The only one who really got shafted in all this is poor Seymour. He did everything he could to find Fry and he waited 12 long years until his death. But the remainder of his life was spent with Fry on his mind. While the beginning of Futurama led us to believe that Fry was a loser who left no impact during his time in New York, by the end of the show, we know just how important his relationships were, and what kind of a hole he left in his wake. Fry even convinced himself he was better off in the future, because the truth is there was no going back. But fortunately, even he was able to get closure of his own, first with his brother, then with Seymour and his family, and finally with his mother. I think these four episodes are some of the best Futurama has to offer. Luck of the Fryerish and Jurassic Bark in particular are truly top tier episodes, but even Cold Warrior and Game of Tones stand out as some of the best episodes of the revival seasons. And yeah, I know that Bender's Big Score does offer a bit of a happier ending for Seymour and Fry's family, but it also kind of lessens the impact of Fry's absence. When you mess with time travel, you get a bunch of paradoxical events, so I sort of just consider the Lars Fillmore and Philip J. Fry timelines to be parallel. And stay tuned, because I actually really want to talk about Lars in an upcoming video, so keep an eye out for that. That's where I want to pass it off to you. Do you think Futurama effectively explored Fry's relationship with his family? Do you think Fry was better off in the year 3000, or would he have lived a better life in the year 2000. Let me know below in the comments, and also let me know if there are any other Futurama topics you want me to cover. Next, I'm thinking about exploring the four separate series finales that were written and aired for the series. And if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe. Seriously, those two small things really help out the channel. All right, talk to you next time. Peace. Johnny! Two